Hello everyone, welcome back. My name is Deanna and this is the Haxton Knits podcast. I'm coming to you from my home in Okinawa, Japan and it's a beautiful day today. It's Monday the 27th of January. Um, hopefully I'll have this edited and up in a timely manner. The nice part about being here in Japan is that I have a day to edit and fuss before uh, putting things up because back in the United States it's still a day behind. Uh, I know not everyone watching this is watching from the US, but being that that is where I grew up and where my home is, I, uh, uh, you know, I'm a little bit in the future and it feels nice. Today I have a lot of things to show you and so I'm really excited. There was a lot of shopping, uh, which is unusual for me, so I have quite a bit of a yarn haul this day. I like to uh, work from my stash whenever possible and whenever my yarn starts to get a little out of hand. I try to go on a little bit of a yarn diet, but this was not the week for a yarn diet. So let's get started. First of all, no beer this week. Um, I have switched back to my day shift life, so I'm not working at night anymore, which means that I'm coming to you in the early hours of the morning as opposed to the wee hours of the morning. Hmm. I don't know how to say that. Anyway, normally I'm podcasting around 2 or 3 in the morning. Now it's about 8 in the morning. So instead of beer, I have milk tea today. Yep, this is one of my favorites here in Japan. It's just a sweet tea. Uh, not sweet like the southern United States sweet tea, but um, definitely a sweet tea and not beer. <laughs> it's way too early for beer. So as you uh, may have figured out, I do talk about beer a lot because I am a home brewer. Uh, those of you who have been with me for a few weeks already know that, so those of you that are just learning this fact, I'm so glad you came to visit me today. This podcast is primarily about knitting, also about spinning, weaving. I haven't shown any weaving yet, but there will be weaving one day, I promise. <laughs> home brewing and my general life here in Okinawa. First of all, I want to talk about what I'm wearing because it is my finished object of the week. This is the Nell sweater. It's called N-E-L-L. -L. It's by Eri, um, Eri TML on Ravelry, and it is beautiful. I'm going to zoom back a little bit here. So um, this has a lovely slip stitch collar, a v-neck, and just a little hint of color work. I have shown this for several episodes in a row because it took me a really long time. It's a fingering weight sweater. I knit this with Destination Yarns. The, um, the line is called Silver Shiny because this has silver Stellina in it. If you can see, oh yeah, you can see that. Hey there. Um, and the colorway is Coal Mine. The accent colors for the color work is Malabrigo Sock Yarn in the color Pearl. And I am just smitten with this sweater. It fits really well. I will say, um, if I were to make it again, I would make the V-neck a little less deep. So I did end up, you can't see because I have a microphone here, but um, I ended up sewing up just a little bit of this to close it up because it was a little bit of a deep V-neck for me, but it came out beautifully. It's the perfect weight for winter here in Okinawa. <laughs> I am indeed wearing it with a pair of shorts and I will pop in a bunch of pictures that my Instagram users will have already seen. Uh, but beautiful sweater, light enough to wear here in the winter in Okinawa. Um, hmm, yeah. I went looking at a bunch of this designer's other sweaters and actually found a sweater I really, really liked as well. It's called the Ambient Sweater. Um, I will pop a picture of this up. It looks like, it looks like they do the yoke in one color and the rest of the body in another. I know that the effect on this sweater is done by holding yarns together, but it reminded me that I had this yarn in my stash. So I um, received a Christmas gift a few years back of the knit crate where you uh, receive a knit box every month in the mail. And this came in that crate. And what reminded me of this sweater is that these two yarns are very complementary in color, but not the same yarn. This one is a little bit more of a tonal, and this is more of a variegated yarn. And I have been thinking for ages of what to do with it, what would be a good pattern to make with it. Um, 
And so the, the ambient sweater, when I saw that, it just kind of reminded me of these two yarns and inspired me to find a way to use them together. These are Ancient Arts yarns. It's a DK weight. It's called Nettle Soft. They are super wash merino, 68% and 32% nettle. And I have actually never knit with anything nettle before. I can't say that they feel very different from uh, maybe any other sock yarn that I've held or worked with. So if you guys have any ideas, let me know. What do you think? What would you make if you had two very close colored yarns, um, but not quite, not quite the same? I don't know. I'm interested to hear your thoughts and ideas. I think um, I was always considering using these as kind of stripes with another contrast color, but I don't know. Future plans. We'll see how that goes. So I went on a little bit of an adventure in search of yarn. I think I've mentioned in other episodes that there aren't a lot of yarn shops here. There are a couple of um, like in the mall craft stores that carry some yarn, but very limited selection. And I know there's more yarn out here there. I just have to find it. And I went searching as I usually do and found some success this week. So um, I had been reading online and a couple of people had suggested a store called Tokyo Hands saying that that might have some yarn. And there are a few of those here in Okinawa. So I went to the one that was closest to me and did not find any yarn at all. So I was very disappointed and I was sitting in the parking lot just sort of Googling. I'm always searching, you know, um, Google Translate. How do you say arts and crafts in Japanese? How do you say yarn in Japanese? How do you say wool? And as I searched this time, it popped up a store. Um, it just came up arts and crafts and a big Japanese name that I couldn't read, but I followed it and was very happy. So <laughs> the store I found was called Craft Heart Tokai and it's located in the Machinato City San A. Um, when I first moved to Okinawa, something that used to really frustrate me is I would ask people, oh, where did you get that from? And they would say from the San A. And I had no idea what that was. <laughs> and I didn't know how to search for it. And I didn't know how to find it. Um, the San A, for those of you who are not familiar with Japan, it's, um, I think of it as like a mall with a grocery store in it. Um, usually there's like a grocery store at the bottom, a fashion section, and then a couple of different shops popped in. They're all different sizes, so they vary a little bit from place to place. Um, we also have the Aeon here, which I think, so Sane, I have seen standalone grocery stores and I've seen standalone Sane fashion stores, and then I've seen the Sane malls. Um, the Aeon, I think I've only seen the malls and they do usually have groceries in them too. So that's what I'm talking about. There's a sane. This one's over near the Okinawa Convention Center and inside was this store and it I think it's primarily a fabric store but it had the most yarn that I've ever seen in one spot in Okinawa so I was very excited. I took way too many pictures and bought quite a bit of yarn. Um, it seems like mainly they carry mainly one brand of Japanese yarn and that brand is called Wister. Wister, W-I-S-T-E-R, which I think is an unusual name for a Japanese brand because those um, letters together aren't really native to the Japanese language, at least to me as an English speaker, I read it Wister. I went online searching and I found um, a couple of videos where Japanese people were talking about this yarn and they called it Wista, Wista. So, um, yeah. I'm going to keep calling it Wister because I'm not Japanese and it sounds funny when it comes out of my mouth. But at that yarn, um, at that yarn, at that shop, there was a ton of very pretty fabric. I, uh, I don't sew much. I do own a sewing machine and I have sewn one or two projects in my life, but that's not really my passion. But some of the yarn or yarn, <laughs> I find that anytime I talk about anything, crafty related, the word yarn just pops out of my mouth instead of fabric, instead of beads, instead of whatever I am working on. So uh, yeah, I'm just passionate about yarn. Anyway, beautiful, beautiful fabric at this store. Um, it reminded me of some of the traditional Okinawan fabrics. So Okinawa has a history of weaving and bingata and um, like dyeing, stencil dyeing and indigo dyeing. Um, 
I suspect these fabrics are not made in the traditional way and they're more commercially produced, but I have been considering going back and buying some, I don't know what I would make, maybe a project bag or a skirt or something very simple because I don't sew very well. Um, but that might be in the future. I may go back and buy some fabric because it was gorgeous. They also had a lot of, um, oh, you know the little eyeballs that you put on the little crocheted creatures? So um, Emigurumi is little crocheted animals. Well, they had every type of eyeball you could possibly think of that you would want to put on to one of those creatures. And that was exciting because I actually hadn't seen very many of those around. So let's get back to it. While I was there, I bought some yarn. I'm going to show you a bunch of this yarn. <laughs> the first of which is uh, Worcester Pop. Here you go. Now this yarn is really cool because it's got these little nips, nips, I don't know, tweedy bits of color and they're just super cute and I know I mentioned in my last episode that I have a lot of pregnant co-workers and so there may be some baby hats in progress here. Um, there's a pattern, it's called Teeny Tot by Kristen Rettig. Rettig? It's a free pattern on Ravelry and it's actually the pattern that I use when I teach someone how to knit for the first time because it is literally just a garter stitch square that you fold in half and you just seam up the edges and attach really cute little pom-poms too and it's adorable. So this may be in the future since this has blue and pink and yellow naps in it. I think I can attach blue or pink pom-poms depending on the gender of the babies or yellow for neutral and uh, that might do the job. Yeah, so that's what those are bought. I bought a couple of skeins of these. They also had them in um, pink with white naps and yellow with white naps there at the store and they were just adorable. Something else I bought there, this is a little out of the ordinary for me, but up by the cash register there were um, these little kits for beaded keychains. I have not worked with beaded keychains before, but they were really pretty and I felt inspired so I thought I'd give them a shot. The instructions were completely in Japanese, which is great. <laughs> it took me a few tries to get started, but I have succeeded. Dun, 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 dun. There you go. Beaded keychain complete. What I liked about this uh, project though is that it doesn't really require anything but the basics. So I had a needle, some thread, and some beads, and that is it. Um, that is my kind of project, man. I love, I love little projects where I don't have to invest in a whole lot of equipment to just get started. And uh, it turned out great. This kit came with the little hardware to make a little keychain. You see these, so these things, these things, I don't know what they are, little charms, little keychains on a little loop like this. You see them a lot here in Okinawa in the um, like tourist shops. You also see them kind of in the shrines. Um, they're just cute little, I would call them a souvenir. I don't really know what they're used for. And I really like the idea that I made this one myself instead of buying it at one of the local shops. So that was a fun little side project. I have some more beads. Um, floating around my house that I bought last year for Sock Madness. So maybe there will be some more beaded projects in the future. I don't, I can't imagine I'm going to do a whole lot more beaded projects, mostly because I feel like I'm going to have to buy reading glasses. <laughs> I just found myself squinting down at my hands like, what am I doing the whole time? So we'll see. But that was a, a fun little side project and a good way to use up some beads that I had floating around the house. So also purchased there, I have, same brand, Worcester March. There you go. And this yarn is a long, slow, color-changing yarn. I feel like Japanese yarns do this really well. This one is 80% acrylic and 20% wool, and this is color number one. I am really impressed with how quickly I learned how to read yarn labels in Japan. Um, I, uh, I'm capable of reading, so here in Japan there are three alphabets. There's the katakana, the hiragana, I call both of those the kana alphabets, and the kanji. Um, and I, I can read both of the kana alphabets and I am slowly working my way into learning the kanji. Um, but some of the first kanji I learned were my yarn labels, um, especially wool. So wool in Okinawa, I'm gonna grab these up so you can see what I'm talking about here. Let's see, I may put a picture in. But this one right here, 
Oh yeah. You know what, instead of holding these up, I'm just gonna take a picture. But basically, um, this white yarn is 80% wool and on the label it is um, shown with the kanji for wool, which looks very similar to, which looks very similar to the um, kanji for hand also, which I think is interesting. Sometimes you'll see um, hand knitting on there and then wool and the two, the two, um, kanji characters look very similar to me. They look like backwards versions of each other. Whereas this yarn, it is 60% wool and it is spelled out in the Kana alphabet. Um, so yeah, <laughs> you know, when you're passionate about something, you learn to read it much quicker than if you aren't. Um, so yeah, wool, acrylic, nylon, those things, I learned to read very quickly. Anyway, I don't have plans for these yarns right now. I'm thinking maybe pair them with a contrast color yarn and do some sort of slip stitch pattern. Maybe cowl, I don't know, or maybe a yoke for a sweater. Future plans for sure. Uh, next, I bought way too many balls of this yarn. This is same brand, Worcester Color Melange, and it is 60% wool, 40% acrylic. I bought one ball of each of these and then a whole bunch of this with the plan of making a yoked sweater. I'm thinking, um, if you remember from last episode, I was working on what, what I was calling the Tanzania point sweater. And I had written up the entire pattern, but at a gauge different than what I actually wanted. So you guys will remember this swatch. And it occurred to me that all I needed to do was uh, get a yarn that would fit the gauge that I had written, written it at and then I didn't have to do anything. So that is more of a worsted to Aran weight yarn and this is more of a light worsted. So I think this will be that sweater eventually. I feel, oh, I feel like a yarn glutton this week because I literally have like bags of yarn overflowing with balls of yarn because I don't know <laughs> where to put it all at the moment because I want to cast on all the projects all at once. Uh, but yeah, this one, like I said, overflowing with yarn for sweaters. <laughs> All right, the last of the yarn from my yarn haul. This one is also Worcester brand. It's called Korupopo. I have no idea what that means. There you go. This one is 100% acrylic and it is colorway 54. <laughs> None of them have named colors, which is probably a blessing because I don't speak any Japanese. But anyway, this yarn, um, you know, all of these yarns have quite a bit of acrylic in them and I don't normally reach for acrylic yarns, mostly because I've been living in very cold climates where I can use the wool. Um, but I thought I'd give this brand a try. I feel like I'm doing a good job of really sampling this brand of yarn because I've got, I've got you know, some worsted weight, mostly wool. I've got some lace weight, acrylic. I've got some color changers. I've got some textured. So uh, I'll have a, a lot of opinions, a thorough overview of this brand of yarn by the time we're done. But this yarn I purchased with an, an idea in mind. So last week I showed you, I think it was last week, I showed you my Kivute cowl. And I talked about how the stitch pattern on it is different depending on where it was knit. So in Alaska, they have that co-op. Um, local villagers knit the yarn and then they um, send the finished products into Anchorage where there's a store that they sell all the finished products and that the knitters in the different villages all have stitch patterns that they use that is specific to that area. The one that I showed you, the stitch pattern was inspired by some uh, traditional clothing that had beadwork or embroidery on the bottom of it and they used that beadwork and embroidery as inspiration for the lace stitch pattern and so I thought that that was a very interesting idea and that wouldn't it be fun to try to create a lace stitch pattern from traditional Okinawa items instead of traditional Alaskan items and, and so I pulled up some pictures of traditional woven items here in Okinawa um, and then I tried to create a stitch pattern that was based off of those items. And here is what I have so far. It is not a lot. Mm, yep, there's not much you can see there. 
Not a lot to show so far for it, but I'm basically attempting to do a cowl with lace um, inspired by local Okinawan fabrics as opposed to um, traditional Alaskan items. It does feel a little sacrilegious to create this in 100% acrylic yarn when it is inspired by a 100% Kivyut pro product, but that's okay. This is just an experiment. We'll see how it goes. But when I picked up the yarn, it reminded me of the Kivyut, mostly in the fact that it was lace weight and slightly fuzzy. So that's what this project is going to be. Um, I don't think I've named this yet. Maybe I'll call it the fusion cowl because it's a, a fusion of traditional Okinawan patterns and inspired by this Alaskan product that's made out of Kivyut. So future, future items to show off. Hopefully I'll have better pictures of that for you. Um, yeah. Also for works in progress this week, I am still spinning. I think if I back up here, you can see my trusty spinning wheel. So that is a shacked babe spinning wheel. Oh no, it is not a babe. What am I saying? Oh, it's a ladybug. That was just rude. I, my first spinning wheel was a, was called a babe spinning wheel. And those of you who know it know that it is made out of PVC pipe and uh, plastic mostly. And it was a heck of a creation. I ended up spray painting it and decorating it and stringing lights on it. Um, it was a very affordable first wheel. Um, and at the time I enjoyed it a lot, but I quickly outgrew it. My main complaint about the, the babe spinning wheel is that the, the tension, so the brake band on it was just a leather strap with a piece of Velcro and all you could do to adjust was sort of uh, tighten down the strap or loosen up the strap. Whereas this wheel, you have a knob to tighten your brake band and it allows you a lot more fine tuning and control, which I found like instantly improved my spinning. So this, uh, this guy back there, I am a very slow spinner and uh, I've been working on the Nest Fiber Club Superwash Merino for a hot minute and I'm sure we'll mention it in episodes to come. So uh, we'll get back to that one another time. Also on the needles right now is what I am calling the Great Tapestry. I made a gauge swatch while I was waiting for my yarn to come in. My gauge swatch is unusual here. Here you go. Here is my, here is my gauge swatch. <laughs> I had plans to do a much better job of gauge swatching, but um, was very quickly getting frustrated because I was getting lost in my very, very large chart. So here you go. These are not the final colors that I will be using, but this is my starter swatch. So the Great Tapestry is going to be a giant picture. I talked to you last week about how I use Stitch Fiddle to create a chart. I'm going to be using three colors. So this is more of my yarn piggery. Knit Picks palette in Asphalt Heather. That's going to be my black. This is Marble Heather, which will be my gray. And Mist, which will be my white. I also bought uh, an extra skein of Merlot Heather. Um, so this pattern has a little bit of a bird. There's two birds on it. And I was thinking about adding those in, but I'm not quite sure how I'm gonna do that yet. So I'm knitting this in the round, stranded color work. I'm using three colors carried across the row, which is new for me, which is why I wanted to do a kind of a hearty gauge swatch, just to get used to managing three yarns at once. So for those of you who have done color work before, you know that there are a couple of options for the way you hold your yarn. So you can either hold both yarns in one hand um, or hold one yarn in each hand or only hold one yarn at a time and just drop the yarn you're not using in between and then pick them up. What I found was fastest for me was to hold one yarn in each hand, which of course means that you have to be good at both continental and uh, English, I think, are the two different <laughs> knitting techniques, so throwing and picking. For me, that wasn't a problem. I initially learned to knit by throwing and then switched to picking. Um, later on, when I wanted to speed up my knitting, I found that I knit a lot faster when I switched to picking. I hesitate to tell you which hand I hold the yarn in because I'm left-handed and I hold it backwards, but I am a left-handed knitter who picks with the yarn in my right hand. So for most of you, you would be holding the yarn in the left hand to do that. Um, because I was carrying three yarns 
at a time, what I started out doing was holding one yarn in each hand and just letting one yarn drop. And then I would just drop and pick up, drop and pick up, but that was getting to be pretty tedious. So now I am attempting to hold two yarns in my right hand, left hand for most of you, and one yarn in my left. Um, and I'm having a little bit more work doing, uh, luck doing that and managing that. It's getting to be a little better. So I may in time uh, perfect the technique of holding both yarns in one hand, but we'll see. I have a hard time with the tension that way. And then of course, I'm also having issues with the floats. So this pattern is uh, created with no thought in mind for how long the floats were going to be behind the rows. Um, those of you who knit color work know that you can catch floats um, to sort of weave them in a little bit. You have to be somewhat careful about where you catch them because the float will kind of peek through a little bit. So for example, if I were trying to catch the white strand of yarn, I would want to catch it at a spot where the row below had a white stitch because then that white bit of yarn peeking through probably wouldn't be noticeable. For the most part with this pattern, because it's sort of trees and branches, um, I don't think it's really gonna matter at all where I catch it in. A little fleck of light here or there is only gonna add more depth to the project, I think. But right here, you can probably see, let's see, can you see the little bit of white poking through? Well, now that I hold it up, I barely see it. Yeah, there it is. Okay, you can kind of see right here no, you really can't. Yes, there, now you can see it. You can just barely see that little bit of white poking through. And so that's something that you have to be careful of when you are um, catching little floats of yarn. If I were smart, I would have caught the float, you know, directly under this white stitch where you could see it. Um, but yeah, this project, I... I'm nervous about. <laughs> so I printed the chart for it and it's huge, huge. Okay, this is the chart. This is 45 pages, <laughs> 45 pages. And I'm just not sure how to manage it. Option one is to glue myself to the computer and only knit from the computer, which I hate doing. I don't like being stuck attached to a computer or whatever. Um, option two is to just work off the paper like this. I'll put a stitch marker at the edge of each page. So basically to mark when I've reached the end of the page and then get maybe some highlighter tape or something like that to help stay on track. Um, if you have worked from a very large chart that doesn't have predictable repeats before, I would love to hear how you manage to stay on track. Um, I think the final project here was 300 stitches. So, yeah, this is going to be a beast of a project. <laughs> this project will be knit in the round. Um, I'm going to steek it, so I'm going to have to do just a little bit of research on steeks. I have done a few, um, but before I get started, I just want to surf around, look for ideas, see what I can do to just make my steaks look as finished as possible when I'm done. My plan is to pick up all the way around the edge and then work an edging in the round with some like mitered squared for the corners. Um, and that edging will buy me a little bit of fudge room if my gauge does not stay perfect because I am trying to fit this into a picture frame, a very, very big picture frame. <laughs> I am knitting this on US size 2.5 needles. I'm gonna look over at my chart here. So US size 2.5 is three millimeter needles and in Japan, it is a size three needle. So Japanese size three, US size 2.5, three millimeter needle. And it's kind of interesting. The Japanese size needles and the US size needles stay close to the same in the smaller sizes and then as you get bigger they drift off from each other. So for example, a US size 2 is a US size is a Japanese size 2. And then as you get bigger, a US size 9 or a 5.5 mm needle is a Japanese size 11 needle and it continues. So a US 10 and a half or a 6.5 mm needle is a Japanese size 15 needle. I don't know why it never occurred to me that there were Japanese size needles. I always assumed it was US sizes and millimeters. 
and it was just that the U.S. doesn't use the metric system, and that is why uh, we had different needle sizes. But no, in fact, there are Japanese sized knitting needles, and I'd love to make a giant chart of all the world knitting needles and, and rattle them off each week, but I'm not going to do that. Anyway, tapestry in progress. My gauge swatch, I did a provisional cast on originally because I was feeling, I was thinking I was going to pick up the edges for my sample, so that's why these bottom edges look a little funny. As far as provisional cast ons go, um, so I know most of you are familiar, provisional cast on is a cast on um, which is designed so that later you will have some live stitches that you can knit from. Um, a good use, a good example of this would be like the crocheted cast on. Um, there are a bunch of different ways to do provisional cast ons and I used to love making a crochet chain and then you knit into the back bumps of the chain because you can then um, just kind of unzip the chain and you're left with all these live stitches. Uh, but over time I have changed my preferences and now I just take a bit of scrap yarn and I use the backwards loop cast on. Um, I don't normally use the backwards loop cast on for many things. It is an easy cast on to teach people how to do so they can cast on right away. But because it has very little structure, it's kind of fiddly and difficult to knit those first rows and it can be difficult to get an even tension on it. But for the purpose of provisional cast ons, it's great because it's very easy to pick out. So I'll just do a backwards loop cast on and then I'll just pull out that cast on as I go and pick up my uh, now live needles. So that is the plan, a provisional cast on using the backwards loop, uh, knit in the round with the steek, and then eventually cut open the steek and pick up all the way around and uh, yeah, knit a border. I don't think I'm ever gonna finish this project. <laughs> we'll see. Even when I was working on the swatch, I just got so lost. Um, if it gives you an idea, this is how big my swatch was, and it was just a teeny section, just a teeny section of the overall chart. So um, we'll see how it goes. I think that's it. I think that's it for knitting content. We're going to talk a little bit about life and beer here. My beer has almost finished. Uh, I told you last week I'm knitting, knitting, God, I love knitting too much. I brewed a uh, attempt at an Orval clone. I had a little bit of problems with the yeast. It didn't take off, so I had to pitch some dry yeast in. Uh, but everything went well, fermented to a uh, specific gravity that I was aiming to hit, and it went into the keg yesterday. So right now it is in the forced carbonation stage. When you are carbonating beer in a keg, you have a couple of options. So um, you can just put it in the keg, put it to your drinking pressure of CO2 and just let it sit for a while. It could be a week or so until it's ready to drink. Or you can put it at a slightly higher carbon um, CO2 pressure. So I've set mine to 20 PSI. Let it sit for a few days, bleed off that extra pressure and set it back down to drinking pressure, which is what I usually do. Or if you're in a really big rush, you can set the pressure even higher and shake the keg vigorously to try to force the carbonation into suspension. I'm not sure if that's the right word there. And then again, bleed off the excess and set it to drinking t uh, pressure, which there's a whole chart for that to figure out what pressure you want based on the style of beer you have and the temperature and the line length of your beer, um, of your tap system. But I generally set mine to 12 PSI and then just tweak it back and forth to my own personal preference as I go. So that beer should be ready to drink in a couple of days here. Um, one of the one of my friends here on this island, she's my yoga instructor, makes her own kombucha on um, makes her own kombucha. There you go. There's the word. <laughs> And we have a, an exchange deal where we trade one for one. So I bring her beer and she gives me kombucha. And this week I got a lovely bottle of Japanese green tea kombucha. She also makes a good um, honey bush, honey bush kombucha, which they're two very different flavors. Like the green tea one is very subtle and soft and the honey bush one is very sour and like in your face. And I like them both a lot. So I'm looking forward to sharing my beer with her and her beer with me. No, it's not beer, it's kombucha. Also this week we spent a little time exploring Okinawa. 
Um, one of my favorite places here in Okinawa is Hamahiga Jima. And Jima is the Japanese word for island, so Hamahiga Island, which originally had the villages of Hama and Higa, so Hamahiga, Hamahiga Jima. Used to be only accessible by ferry, but now they have a bridge built out to it, and it is just a gorgeous place. It feels like the real world has not quite touched it yet. There are a lot of very traditional Okinawan houses. It's just gorgeous. Um, we started by visiting the tomb of Amamichu, which is, um, the sign says the creator god of the Ryukyu Islands. So the story in Hamahiga is that two gods, a god and a goddess, a male and a female god, came down to the island and they had children and they sort of grew the population of that island and that this is the tomb where they are laid to rest. Um, gorgeous spot, just a beautiful little, little teeny island. It used to be that you could only walk out to it at low tide, but they have since built a little uh, concrete walkway out there so you can get there now. From there, we walked across the island through the old village to the Shrimuchi uh, sacred ground. And this is, it's a pretty spot. There's about a hundred stairs up to a limestone cave. And it is said that this is where those two gods lived and had their children. And uh, now it's a sacred site where people come to worship, especially now that we've just passed the new year here. There's been a lot more activity, a lot more people coming to the local shrines for their year, you know, to, to worship for their year and for blessings. Once we were done there, we explored the beaches a little. I took a lot of pictures. I got to wear my extra tough shoes and tramps around in the water and look for shells and fish. And then on the way back, we stopped at one of the local farmer stands. There are several farmers that live on the island. It's really a beautiful place. So there's the beach, this rocky, beautiful beach, and then this big like hill and kind of down in the valley between the hills is this flat farmland. And I just, I love it. I would choose to probably live there if I had the choice, if it was closer to work or if I retired to Okinawa, that's where I'd want to stay. And I remembered that I had seen online that there was a goat farm on the island and the uh, owner of the farm had offered for people to come and feed the baby goats. You're supposed to make reservations or call ahead and we didn't, so we didn't actually bother him, but we set out on foot to see if we could find the farm and we did and it was exciting. So there were goats and ducks and chickens and a horse and cats and they were all very friendly and they all ran into the street to come and greet us. So we spent a moment saying hello and then realized that perhaps we should not be disturbing this farmer's animals or luring them into the road even though there was almost no traffic. Um, but yeah, so it was a fun little adventure. We went for a long walk. We saw some pretty sights. I um, got to practice my Japanese interacting with the, the woman who owned the farmer's stand and successfully asked how much for some onions and, and asked for a couple of bundles of them. And that was exciting for me. My Japanese skills are slowly but surely coming into um, a little bit of usefulness. <sighs> But yeah, beautiful place. I'll try to pop in lots of pictures and videos of that. I actually think that's it for today. Uh, I know it feels like a little bit of a light episode for me today. I feel like I kind of rambled, but beautiful day. I am having a hard time adjusting back to day shift. I've been finding myself very, very tired when I should be awake. And I'm also trying to cut down on the amount of caffeine in my life. So. I think that's it. I'm going to call it a day. I am glad you decided to join me. As always, you can find me on Instagram and Ravelry as Haxton Knits. Um, I am trying to take over the Okinawa Yarnies group on Ravelry. Um, I participated in this group several years ago when I lived in Okinawa previously, and when I came back to the island, I was dismayed to find that the group had sort of died. The last content of activity was more than three years ago, and there's no longer an administrator in the group. So I have put in a request to Ravelry to get administrative rights. So once that happens, hopefully I'll be able to update it with all new information. I am going to participate in Sock Madness again this year, I think, and I thought it would be really nice to have some local um, people to knit with me on those projects. So maybe I'll get 
be able to get a small Okinawa team of knitters to participate in Sock Madness. We'll see how that goes. Um, yeah, but that's it for now. Have a great day, guys. I'm so glad you joined me, and I'll see you next week. And chickens. Chickens, black box, horsey. Apparently. I am not to be trusted. He's right behind me. He just won't let me touch him. Oh, hey, little kitty. I know, I see another kitty coming and some ducks. <coughs> to go home, kid. You can't come with us. You are not our kitten. <laughs> oh no, the ducks are following us. Go home. <laughs>